Well, this evening's lecture is about the battle of the Bibles. We won't really be going into the Bible directly tonight. We'll be looking at the history in this battle. And tomorrow night we'll be looking at the Bible itself. So don't forget to bring your Bibles tomorrow night. What is this battle all about? You will know that in the past the Bible was a very, very important issue and there were wars fought over this Bible and the Church of the Middle Ages banned the Bible and today everybody seems quite satisfied that everybody has a Bible. So has attitude changed or has something else changed? Matthew chapter 4 verse 4 But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Obviously it's important that we know the word of God. Isaiah chapter 8 verse 20 says, To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. In other words, if you do not speak according to the word of God, and if you do not speak according to the testimony, that which the prophets have iterated regarding God's actions, which had to be in harmony with the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, then there is no light in them. So don't come with something contrary to the word of God. Revelation 22 verse 18 says, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life, and out of the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. That's pretty serious. Now, today we have many Bibles. And there are hosts of translations of the Bibles. Now, which one is the best? They will tell you that the modern ones are the best. And yes, in many ways, with the modern Greek scholarship, a lot of the verses in the modern Bibles have better translations than in the old versions because of better knowledge of the Greek terminology. But if the grammar is improved, does that necessarily mean that the context have, has to be improved or changed? That's when you get into trouble. So what is the family tree of the modern Bibles which we have in the world today? The original manuscripts of all Bibles have been lost. They don't exist anymore, so all we have is copies of copies. Some of them are very old, some of them are less old. And there are basically three, although we will actually see there are only two, really, streams of Bibles. You, the ones that are uh, at the base, in other words the oldest ones, are all lost manuscripts, so they are all copies of previous manuscripts. Now, as far as the Bible that led to the King James Version in the English language, they come from the central tree. These are, they, they are lost manuscripts of the traditional text, and they come basically from the Syriac, from the Gothic virgin, versions. There's a Codex W and a Codex A, and then there is a vast majority of extant texts which make up the New Testament manuscripts, and we're talking about 1,900 manuscripts in this central block, from which eventually we have the King James Version and every other Bible except the Roman Catholic and the Jesuit Bible, every single Bible in the world that was written before 1914. Every single one comes from here. Then there are two other streams. The one is the, uh, the one that le led to the Douay version, which is basically the Jesuit version. And the ancestor of Western family that is lost, and the text is an expansion of an original text, 
And there you have the old Latin version. You have the Latin Vulgate version, which the Pope declared to be infallible. You have Codex D, Codex D2, Codex E2, and the Douay version of 1582, which was written to counteract the Reformation. That's the one stream. And manuscripts belonging to the same family have the same text. They all agree closely in the wording. Then there's another tree, which is the ancestor of the Alexandrian family. And the original is also lost, of course, as we see. And there you have a few interesting documents. And these are relatively new, but they are old documents that have been found lately. Papyrus 75, Codex B are two of them. Then you have Papyrus 66, and then the most famous of them all, Codex Aleph. And from this very small stream of four manuscripts, you have the Revised Version, the American Standard Version, the Revised Standard Version, and the New English Bible, and all the hosts of new ones that are coming out in all the languages of the world are based on these manuscripts over here. So in the central block, you have thousands of manuscripts, but the, this particular one over here, Codex Aleph, is one of the very oldest that there is. And of course, the old Latin versions and the Vulgate are also based on relatively old documents. Now, so all of them come from old documents. The oldest ones that we have come from this stream over here. Does old necessarily mean good? Today, we equate old with good. Now, old does not necessarily mean good. That's a very important point to remember. If we look at the central one over here, with thousands of copies in all the languages of the world, just about, then this is a very interesting point. If I have a franchise, let's say I have developed a new brand of chicken to sell to someone. And I have a wonderful recipe, which I'm now going to base a franchise on, and I send it to every country in the world, and they're going to follow this recipe by the letter, and we're going to sell uh, blue pumpkin chicken or whatever in this franchise. Now everybody gets the original recipe and diligently translates it, because the Germans need it in German, and the Portuguese need it in Portuguese, and the Spanish in Spanish, etc. So each one diligently copies it. And now there are literally thousands of copies in various languages of the original one that was written and sent out. Over the years, the original one gets copied so many times that it, it falls apart. So all you have is copies. That's all you have. And then one day, somebody says to himself, you know, that's a pretty good recipe, I wish I could just change it a little bit and steal the franchise for myself. So he alters the recipe and says, Hello, folks, I've got the original recipe. Here it is. You know, he burns it a little bit and makes it look old and what have you. Not that this happened here, but anyway, he's got the original, manu the original recipe. And he starts his franchise with the new recipe. Now everybody says, wow, which one is now the original one? This one or that one? This is highly problematic. Now we have two. Which one is the right one? Well, what do you do? You say, now hang on a second. The original one has been copied and translated in so many different languages. Let's get the German one and the Spanish one and the Greek one and the this one and the Armenian one and the Serbian one, and we'll check it out. And lo and behold, they all agree with this one but not with that one. Which one was then the original one? The one that has the cloud of witnesses supporting it, yes or no? Okay. And that you'll find only in the central stream. There's a cloud of witnesses in the central stream. I mean, there are just 1,900 documents there alone that all agree. Now, the originals have been copied so much, many times, they're gone. But, and now this is interesting, in this stream over here, there are many verses gone, just absolutely gone. And in this stream over here, there are many verses that are just gone, that are in this stream over here. Now, we don't have the original manuscripts, so the, the, 
The followers of this stream say, ah, they weren't in the original. After all, these are old documents. And this stream says they weren't in the original. You see what they're saying? But what if you had very ancient letters from the church fathers, which often obviously weren't as copied as much as the Bible was, as a document. And you have very ancient letters from very ancient church fathers writing to each other. Now, if I write a letter to my wife, for example, I'm sitting in this country and she's in another country, and I write her a nice letter, and I'm encouraging her, giving her a few quotes out of the Bible. That everybody does, isn't that so? So we have these ancient letters, and there are quotes of verses which don't happen to appear there. But the letters are older than those manuscripts. Then which one would be the right one? Which one would you suggest? And obviously the ones that are in line with here, the center, because they're quoting verses that don't even exist in those. And that is the case. That's how it is. So why do we have these three streams, and what is it all about? Now, Kurt Alant, who is co-editor of both of the most widely used critical Greek texts and who is certainly the leading textual scholar on the European continent, proposes that the texts of P75 and B, in that Alexandrian stream, represent a revision of a local text of Egypt which was enforced as the dominant text in that area. So basically, we don't have four, we just have two, and the one is just a modification of the other, so basically there's just one document in that left stream, and that is that Sinaiticus text. We'll come to that in a moment. Then uh, David Otis says, fundamentally there are only two streams of Bibles. The first stream, which carried the received text in Hebrew and Greek, precious manuscripts were preserved by such as the church at Pella, in Palestine, where Christians fled when in 70 AD the Romans destroyed Jerusalem. So the original manuscripts were not in Rome. They came from the Christian area. They came from Jerusalem. They came from Syria. There where the apostles preached. That's where the original manuscripts were, and that's the logical place for them to be because that's where the apostles were. Isn't that right? by the Syrian church of Antioch, which produced eminent scholarship by the Italic church in northern Italy, and also, by the way, the Christians in northern Italy previously received their scriptures from the Middle Eastern route and not from Rome. And there was a major problem between the Ostrogoths and those in Rome because they had different scriptures. Very interesting. So northern Italy had the same as those in the Middle Eastern regions. And also at the same time, by the Gallic Church in southern France and by the Celtic Church in Great Britain, the pre-Valdensians and the Valdensians and the Reformation, they all had the same basic manuscripts. These manuscripts have in agreement with them the vast majority of all the copies of the original text. So that central stream, this is called the received text, or the textus recepticus. So vast is this majority that even the enemies of the received text admit that the 1920th of all Greek manuscripts are of this class. Just about everyone is of that class. And then there's a second stream, which is a very small one, and it's based on ancient manuscripts. Let's not doubt that. And they represent in Greek the Vatican Manuscript, or Codex B, in the library at Rome, and this one was used to counteract the Reformation, because it says different things to the one that the Reformers used. So at the time of, of the Reformation, Codex B became very prominent. And then we have the Sinaitic text, or Codex Aleph. Now that is one that was found in, Alex, in the region of Egypt, uh, I'll show you the place later, and it comes from an Alexandrian text. So we have this one, and it was found on a very interesting date. It was found in 1844. 1844. So this is the youngest find of all the ancient manuscripts, and it is a very old document. 
So when it says in your new Bibles that this translation is based on ancient manuscripts, then the idea is planted that ancient means good. Are you with me? But ancient doesn't necessarily mean good. It just means ancient. That's all it means. In Latin, there's the Vulgate, or Latin Bible, of Jerome, 383 AD. That's pretty old. And uh, there are some problems with that, as we will see just now as well. In English, there's the Jesuit Bible of 1582. That was written in the vulgar tongue, if you like, to counteract the Reformation Bible, which later, with vast changes, is seen in the Douay, or Catholic Bible, which is the one on which the Good News Bible and all of those are based today, and in English again in many modern Bibles. The present controversy between the King James Bible in English and the modern version is the same old contents fought out between the early church rival sects. So the early church had this battle because these ancient manuscripts are different, and the modern church has this battle. So both of them had the battle. There was a battle in the beginning. There was a war in the middle when the Reformation came out, a literal war, eventually, over this word. And now we have another battle looming in our time, the final battle. This will be the last one, I think. That's my opinion. So, the battle was waged between the Valdenses and the Papists, from the 4th to the 13th century, and later between the Reformers and the Jesuits in the 16th century, and today the battle is going to be waged between whoever represents the Bibles that these people also defended, and whoever represents the other side. We need to understand that many of the new translations are taken from old manuscripts, no doubt, as I've explained. People think that these are more reliable. No, they're just old. In actual fact, they are saying, now listen carefully, that a manuscript that was found in a waste paper basket in a cave at Mount Sinai, and questionable manuscripts from Alexandria, where you had all this occultism, are more reliable than the received text. That's what they're saying. So these questionable ones are more reliable. In fact, the one found at Mount Sinai was thrown away because it had been copied over, rubbed out, and judging by the, the science of looking at how many times pieces had been rubbed out and rewritten, it seems that it has been rubbed out and rewritten in many places up to 70 times. In fact, it was so rubbed out and rewritten that they threw it away. But that is the manuscript on which everything is based today as reliable. Now, where do these manuscripts come from? Now, there's a man by the name of Oregon, who was an old initiate, we'll find him in the Masonic writings, as an insider initiate. That's interesting. If I find somebody praised in the Masonic writings, my ears prick up. He was a textual critic, and he's supposed to have corrected numerous portions of the sacred manuscripts. Now, this is in ancient, ancient times. Evidence to the contrary shows that he changed them to agree with his human philosophy of mystical and allegorical ideas. For example, he believed that man was divine, and therefore there was not just one divine man that came to this earth. We are all divine, which is Masonic teaching even to this day. And so they believe that these manuscripts actually were corrupted. So, from the birth of Christ to about 400 AD, some Gnostic Gospels appeared. And other writings were written. Paul makes mention of this. And he says in 2 Corinthians 2 verse 17, For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. So in Paul's time, were they corrupting the word of God? Yes or no? Yes, they were corrupting it. And they were corrupting it with Gnostic ideas. And this is to bring them in line with an ecumenical thinking that all religions are basically the same. We shouldn't elevate one above another. In 331 AD, and this is where the problem really starts now, Constantine ordered an ecumenical Bible. You see, Christianity was saying, 
Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and all the doctrines regarding to Christianity were problematic because they were in the face of paganism. And so Constantine, who tried to marry the two, he commissioned a man by the name of Eusebius, who was, by the way, a follower of Oregon, to write an ecumenical Bible. That is to change the Word of God using Gnostic writings so that it would be acceptable to pagans as well as to Christians. And that's what they did. But the early Christians rejected these manuscripts and said they are not from God. And so they went into secret libraries and there they lay, later to be dug up as ancient manuscripts. There were about 50 copies made by Eusebius, and they were distributed, and they ended up largely in two areas, namely in Rome and in Alexandria, where you had the esoteric um, studies. For example, oh, we'll go into that a little bit later. And Oregon believed in the so-called Arian heresy. Now, the Arian heresy is that Jesus was not God, and uh, that God is basically, if you like, a form of pantheistic God in everything, so we basically could also have a divine spark in us, which is Masonic teaching. Now, it's interesting that Roman Catholicism claims that it's anti-Aryan, and that it fought wars and destroyed people that were Aryan. There is no evidence, let me tell you now, there is no historic evidence that the nations that were destroyed because they were Aryan, like the Ostrogoths, for example, or the Vandals, that they were actually Aryan, because we have none of their writings. Every piece of their literature has been destroyed. We only have the word of Roman Catholicism that they were Aryan. But now I have some interesting news for you. Remember I told you yesterday that the Templars have two doctrines. One is exoteric and one is esoteric. One is for the goyim, for the cattle, and one is for the insiders. Now the gospel to the outside is non-Aryan, but the insider gospel of Roman Catholicism is Aryan. Now what do you do with that? And how do I know that it's Aryan? It's because the Pope has declared the Vulgate as an infallible Bible, and the Vulgate is Aryan. It removes the deity of Christ. Isn't that interesting? So what's the battle about? The battle is about Jesus Christ, just as it was since prehistory. The battle is about the Son of God. And who are we going to defend? Jesus or someone else? So this is an interesting battle. I find this a fascinating battle. 1481 AD, the Vatican manuscript was discovered in the Vatican Library. Isn't that interesting? just in time to counter the Reformation. Just in time. Because the Reformation was using the received text. There was no other text. So you must now believe that up until 1481, God had kept the truth of the Bible away from all generations up to 1481. They all were based on wrong manuscripts. And fortunately, the Vatican discovered the right manuscript in 1481 to counter the Reformation. And this manuscript repeatedly sets aside the deity of Christ and its Arian. So that is insider doctrine. This is Templar doctrine because we saw it yesterday in the lecture that we did yesterday. And it is probably a manuscript that survived from Eusebius. And by the way, this one and the one that they found at Sinai are birds of a feather that flock together. They are very much the same. So that's why there are basically only two streams. The vast majority, Textus Recepticus, and then the stream. And then the magic date, 1844. The Sinaitic manuscript is discovered at Mount Sinai in a monastery in St. Catherine's. Very interesting. That's the old Coptic church which is basically the Eastern Byzantine Church, which was exactly the same as Catholicism because they were one and the same. And it agrees 
absolutely with a Vatican manuscript, manuscript and it is totally Aryan. By 1881, two professors from Britain, Westcott and Hort, created the Greek text. And uh, this is based, of course, on these manuscripts, on the Vatican manuscript and the Sinai manuscript, leaning heavily on the Sinai manuscript so that it wouldn't appear too overly Catholic. Are you with me? It mustn't appear too overly Catholic because these were Protestants. Well, let's rather say they were supposedly Protestants. And the Jehovah's Witness Bible was then changed as a result of this new writing. Now, this was in the early 1900s when these things started coming out, and the Jehovah's Witnesses had no other Bible than the King James. So one day, they were told, take your King James Bibles, and as they came in, they were given a thick black pen, and they were told, now, let's modify the King James. Cross out, zap, 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 whatever it is, and they crossed out. They didn't have their Bible. It didn't exist in the early 1900s, so the Jehovah's Witnesses were the first to just cross out huge sections of the Bible. I'll show you that tomorrow night, what they crossed out. And it must be emphasized that the argument is therefore not between an ancient text and a recent one, but between two ancient texts. Are you with me? That's the argument. And, uh, well, it's an interesting one. Now, Tyndall, he, of course, used the received text, and this really irritated the Vatican, because the other one hadn't been found yet, by the way. And he used the received text in his Bible and said to the Pope, if God spare my life before many years, I will cause a boy that driveth a plow to know, know more about the scriptures than thou doest. That was quite a statement. Once again, I would like to reiterate, the argument is not King James versus other versions. The argument is received text, textus recepticus, versus the small little stream that comes from Sinai, and the Vatican. That's the argument. By the way, any Bible in any language that existed before the 1900s is received text. So if you go to Serbia, they have the received text. If you go to Greece, they have the received text in Greek. If you go to any country in the world, the Lutheran Bible, any Bible, they're all based on received text. Every single one. But after 1900, the modern ones are no longer based on that. Well, when this Bible came out, the Jesuits were called in to help. Big crisis. Because now it was plain that the teaching of Rome was not in accordance with the Bible. And this is one of their statements. Notice what the Jesuits wrote. We must undermine the Bible of the Protestants and destroy their teachings. The Queen of England, realizing the damage the Jesuit Bible could do, sent to Europe for Bazaar, who was with John Calvin, to help Cartwright to write this new uh, manuscript. Uh, he took hold of the Greek manuscripts and the Latin manuscripts from the received text, and he hit the Jesuit Bible blow after blow. So, war broke out. So eventually they sent the Spanish Armada against England to make war, and they came with 136 armed ships with 50 cannons, and all England had was a measly 30 ships. These huge galleys came, they were going to flatten England because of this Bible. Well, Sir Francis Drake got up that morning, he must have been very nervous, but what did he find? A storm had come up in the night, and the Spanish galleys lay smashed upon the shores as high up as Scotland, the entire fleet destroyed in the storm. And all that he had to do was mop up. And from that day, England became a great sea power. That's history. Now, what did the Jesuits say about the Bible? Here's the quote. Then the Bible, that serpent which is with its head erect and eyes flashing, flashing, threatens us with its venom while it trails along the ground, shall be challenged into a rod, changed into a rod as soon as we are able to seize it. 
For three centuries past, this cruel asp has left us no repose. You well know with what folds it entwines us and with what fangs it gnaws us. They hate it, the Bible. The Jesuit Catechism, there is the quote, says, Question, what if the Holy Scriptures command one thing and the Pope another contrary to it? Answer, the Holy Scriptures must be thrown aside. What is the Pope? He is the Vicar of Christ, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, and there is but one judgment seat belonging to God and the Pope. That's quite a statement. Now, what is Freemasonry saying? It's always nice to have the comparative documents. Morals and Dogma, the source, page 818. Regarding the Bible, Pike writes, the absurd reading of the established church, taking literally the figurative, allegorical, and mythical language of a collection of oriental books of different ages, well, it's pretty derogatory, the folly of regarding the Hebrew books as if they had been written by the unimaginative, hard, practical intellect of the England of James I, and the bigoted stolidity of Scottish Presbyterianism. Boy, he didn't like that translation. He hated it. And how did he feel about the Templars and the Jesuit version? The better to succeed and win partisans, the Templars sympathized with regrets for dethroned creeds. They sympathized with paganism and encouraged the hopes of new worships, promising to all liberty of conscience and a new orthodoxy that should be synthesis of all the persecuted creeds. So you see, Freemasonry hates the received text. It has it in its lodge purely as a symbol. That's so clever. That's so diabolical, isn't it? That's, ah, forget it. Going back to the time of the early church, we find Coptic versions, Latin versions, Syrian versions, and they were circulated long before the Vaticanus appeared. So, then come two Cambridge professors who did not even believe in verbal inspiration of the scriptures, Westcott and Hort, and they're going to change everything now. By the way, Jerome's Bible, which is the one that is used in the Vatican, the Latin Vulgate, how could Helvidius, a contemporary, have accused Jerome of employing corrupt Greek manuscripts if Helvidius had not had pure Greek manuscripts? So while Jerome was writing this Latin Bible, other scholars were already saying, hey, you're using corrupt manuscripts for this. So this battle is an ancient battle. It's not a new battle. So these revised versions are based on manuscripts from Egypt that were definitely corrupted. That's what most of the critics say. One of the greatest critics of all time is Dean Bergen. And when this great man died, then corruption took hold. He was a bastion. Bergen writes, the work of the evangelists and apostles, apostles recognized as the necessary counterpart and complement of God's ancient scripture become the New Testament. And then he says, it received as good a reception as did Jesus Christ himself. They nailed Jesus to the cross. Would not they nail his word to the cross as well? That's basically what he says restless malice and unsparing assaults against the Word of God from the very beginning. And he, what does he say about these manuscripts that were found? He says, we oppose facts to their speculation. They exalt B and Aleph and D8 because in their own opinions these copies are the best. They weave ingenious webs and invent subtle theories because their paradox of a few against the many requires ingenuity and subtlety for its support. Very good writer. He took them apart. I am utterly disinclined to believe, continues Dietz Bergen, so grossly improbable does it seem that at the end of 1,800 years, 995 copies out of every thousand suppose will prove untrustworthy, and that the one, two, three, four, or five which remain, whose contents were still yesterday as good as unknown, will be found to have retained the secret of what the Holy Spirit originally inspired. Interesting point of view. He further goes on to say, what in the meantime is to be thought of those blind guides 
those deluded ones who would now, if they could, persuade us to go back to those same codices of which the church had already purged herself. Go back to those ancient manuscripts, and he takes Tischendorf, the man who discovered this manuscript, takes him apart, takes Tregellis apart, Hort apart, and uh, shows that he thoroughly disagrees with their scholarship. And then this interesting statement, who but those with Roman Catholic sympathies could ever be pleased with the notion that God preserved the true New Testament text in secret for almost 1,000 years and then finally handed over to the Roman pontiff for safekeeping. That's what it boils down to. That's literally what it boils down to. Dr. Hoskia quotes from Dr. Salmon. He says, Naturally, Hort regarded these manuscripts as most trustworthy, which give the reading recognized by Oregon. See? That's what they did. Hort, the professor from England, he was an Oregon follower. And we will have to prove that. We can't just make statements like that. You will always be my friend, but I can no longer ignore the criticism. This is Dr. Frank Lockson to F. Lockman, one of the great translators himself. I cannot refute them, and dear brother, I have not a thing against you, but the only thing I can do under God is to renounce every attachment to the new American Standard Bible. So here's one of the committee detaching himself personally. Well, let's go to Alexandria and see what we can find. Here is the statue of Horus, the secret of the initiated ones. Horus and Isis and Dionysius, these secrets were kept alive at Alexandria, and the Alexandrian library was world, world famous for its occult documents. Then, of course, the very early Christians who were Bible-based got rid of that terrible uh, information place, and they burnt the old Alexandrian library to the ground, which was a catastrophe for the occult world. Well, fortunately, UNESCO, and this is very interesting, UNESCO, whose constitution was written by a Skull and Bones member, just for interest's sake, decided to restore it and rebuild it in exactly the same spot. There it is today. And uh, the lamps that they've put down, they have interesting stuff on them, like little angels carrying cornucopias, which we discussed yesterday. If you go and look at the library... It is huge, and it has all the pagan inscriptions on it that the original library had on it. It is made according to the model. All the pagan petroglyphs and the ancient sun worship symbols are on it. And this is Demetrius of Falerium, the founder of the Alexandrian uh, library. In it, they still have some of the ancient manuscripts that happened to escape. Here you have papyrus of the zodiac sign, something that the Bible forbids. Here you have a piece of the Book of the Dead, which is the Egyptian Book of the Dead, which is the counterpart to what the Bible teaches. It exalts the God of the dead. The Bible exalts the God of the living. Then you have these petroglyphs here, which are too disgusting, so let's just go away. And they have the deities in their hexagons and Socrates, an ancient mystic. Socrates, of course, died from drinking hemlock. He was an initiate, and he released some of the secrets. And according to the oath, if you do that, you can die of the poison cup if you choose, or you could have your throat slit from ear to ear and uh, your tongue ripped out of your mouth. He chose the hemlock. The dead are exalted. This library is absolutely enormous. One cannot even imagine how big it is. I made one small video of it. Let's have a look what it looks like. Just to give you an idea of the size, it's absolutely enormous. And uh, all the interesting pagan symbols are there. A total replica of what once must have existed there. Well, just to show that I was there, because otherwise people think I wasn't, taken from high up in the library, it was opened by uh, Mubarak in 2002. It's spanking new, spanking new. I had to go and see it. I had to go and photograph it. And uh, here they have a statue of Prometheus bearing the fire. 
according to the occult writings, that's Lucifer, the light bearer, and some of the symbols on the walls, on the retaining walls. Now, let's just have a look at some of the manuscripts which Rome says are essential for um, understanding the greater gospel. And Rome placed the Bible, and that is only the Textus Recepticus, by the way, on the index of prohibited books. They didn't place their Vulgate on the index of prohibited books. It's the Protestant Bible that they placed there. So the early church of Antioch, as I've already said, used these Syrian manuscripts, and this is a book that uh, is forbidden by Rome. The Septuagint, on the other hand, was made for Alexandria, for the library there, in 285 BC. So, interesting um, data. The apocryphal books, that means hidden things. The Council of Trent said the following, in 1546, whoever shall not receive as sacred and canonical all these books, and every part of them, as they are commonly read in the Catholic Church and are contained in the old Vulgate Latin edition, or shall knowingly and deliberately despise the aforesaid traditions, let him be accursed. So they said we must accept all of these manuscripts. Let's briefly run through them. Let's go th to Tobias 6 verses 4 to 8, where it says, Open the fish and take the heart and the liver and the gall, if a devil or an evil spirit trouble any, we must make a smoke thereof before the man or the woman, and the party shall no longer be vexed. As for the gall, it is good to anoint the man that has witness in his eyes, and he shall be healed. So if you want to drive away evil spirits, demons, then wave the gall of a fish and make a smoke thereof, and it will go away. The Bible says, and signs will follow those believing these things. In my name they shall cast out demons, Mark 16, 17. Acts 16, verse 18 says, Being distressed and turning to the demonic spirit, Paul said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, and it came out that hour. So he didn't use the gallbladder of a fish. Tobias 12, verse 9 says, For arms does deliver from death and shall purge away sin. Oh, that's nice, so you can pay to get your sins taken away. Peter says, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. Two opposing doctrines. Which one is right? Do you think you can buy your way to heaven? Prayer to the dead, Maccabees 12, verse 43 to 46, for if he had not hoped that they were slain, would he have risen again? It had been superfluous and vain to pray for the dead. Whereupon he made reconciliation for the dead that they might be delivered from sin. So you can pray for the dead that they are delivered from sin? This is paganism. John 1, 7 says, Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. There's no such thing. That brings us to the Vulgate Bible, 1545 to 1563. That was the one which was declared infallible. Now what does the Vulgate say? Our Bible says all Scripture is God-breathed. The Douay, which is based on the Vulgate, says all Scripture is inspired of God is profitable. So only some Scripture is inspired. Hebrews 11.21 says, Jacob worshipped as he leaned on top of his staff. The Vulgate says, Jacob adored the top of his rod. That means you can pray to a relic. You can pray to a statue. That's where they get their doctorate from. It also says in Revelation, in the received text, blessed are they, oh no, this is Codex Vaticanus, blessed are they which wash their robes. But the King James says, blessed are they that do his commandments. Well, the Dead Sea Scrolls, these were writings meticulously copied by the Essenes. The ancient manuscripts that they copied were exactly like those found in the Bible today. So they proved that the Bible had not changed in all this time. And these manuscripts were very exciting. But then some other Interesting manuscripts have been found besides this famous uh, one that was found near Alexandria. And that is 
a whole series of Gnostic Gospels, and Time magazine reported on these some time ago. Words from the past, 46 scriptures dug up near Nag Hammadi in Egypt in 1945 changed views of early Christianity. Now, interestingly, Egypt was the seat of the occult science, and these were buried to keep them safe. From whom? Obviously, the early Christianity that destroyed that ancient pagan library, and these manuscripts have now been found since 1945 and are changing the world view. Some Buddhists are saying, had we known that Christianity had such manuscripts, we needn't even have been Buddhists. Well, what do these manuscripts say? These are the so-called lost gospels that are so famous today. You have the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Peter, and all these wonderful manuscripts throwing light on what the early Christians believed. Well, there were Ebionites, there were Marcionites, there were Gnostics, there were Thomasines. All of them basically believed in the deity of man and the non-exclusive deity of Jesus Christ. All of them. Let's read what the Gospel of Peter had to say that was dug up, and you tell me whether you think this is trustworthy. Well, let's read it. By the way, these uh, Gnostic writings are apocryphal, and therefore they are sacred. The cross talked and walked. Jesus had died the day before, uttering his last words. My power, O oh power, you have left me behind. His body was taken down and placed in the tomb, but now, as the Sabbath dawned, oops, which day is now the Sabbath? Sunday has become the Sabbath here. The Sabbath, as Sunday, was kept only in Alexandria, in the Egyptian realm, and in Rome. The rest of the world kept Sabbath, the seventh day. So in this one, the Sabbath has moved to Sunday. Sabbath dawned, a great voice came from the sky, is that trustworthy? Well, let's see how, rest, how trustworthy the rest is. A great voice came from the sky, and two men descended. The stone blocking the tomb rolled away of its own accord. The Bible doesn't say that. And while Roman soldiers gaped, three men emerged from the tomb, two of them supporting the other. Oh, Jesus couldn't walk when he came out. His resurrection was, you know, not quite that illustrious. With a cross following behind. Oh, all by itself. Was the cross buried with him? No, the cross walked behind. Why? Because they made the cross a very prominent symbol in those days. The heads of the two reached up to the sky, but the head of the one they were leading went up above the sky. And they heard a voice, Have you preached to those who are sleeping? So here we have doctrine of preaching to the dead. And a reply came from the cross. Yes. Do you trust this gospel? If you do, I feel sorry for you. I think it belongs where that other one was found, in the trash. <laughs> Let me take you to Sinai. Well, I was interested to go to St. Catherine's, where this manuscript, this famous manuscript on which all modern translations are based, was found. Here it is, St. Catherine's Protectorate. This is the monastery, the famous monastery. Here are the skulls of the monks that uh, were active there. And if you like, you can pray to them and get a blessing. They will answer you, apparently. I, I didn't see any possibility of answering me. They had no breath in them, but nevertheless, you can if you want to. This is Sinai, so they say. And in the church, you find the symbols of sun and moon and all the pagan symbols. The famous Sinai Library. Uh, where this was found, where you have all these ancient handwritten codices, these ancient manuscripts, and the famous Codex Sinaiticus, which was found by Tischendorf in 1844. So there we have it. So it was handed over to Catholic scholars in 1844 and uh, from the University of Leipzig. Interesting date. That's Codex Sinaiticus. There you have some of the ancient manuscripts that are in that place. And uh, some interesting history about this monastery. The bene benevolent treatment of the monastery of Sinai by the Arabs. It was never destroyed by the Arabs. So Islam had no quarrel with them. Who took the peninsula in the 7th century, 
is due to the patent of Muhammad and its protection with rights and privileges which Prophet Muhammad, founder of Islam, granted to the monks of the monastery of Sinai. So Muhammad protected this monastery. Who else protected it? Well, here's another interesting document. Napoleon Bonaparte, who was a 33-degree Freemason. By the way, if there was such a thing in those days, his brother was the Grand Master in Spain, and he was a high Freemason. Those degrees had not yet existed at that stage to that degree, but he was one of the highest initiates. He protected this monastery. Interesting people protected this monastery. This is the famous Four Gospels of Codex Sinaiticus. That's my friend over there. We are going into the monastery and some of the paintings in the monastery. And then this fascinating bush over here with all these people lining up to pray in front of this bush. This is a famous bush. In fact, this bush has survived for thousands of years and has never, ever been watered. Never been watered. In fact, it is one of the most famous bushes in the history of the world. It is the famous burning bush that Moses bowed down to, so they say. They told us it had never been watered. I was inquiring what that pipe was there, <laughs> but they in insisted that it was a, a dead pipe, which it was, there was no water in it, but I, it's a very prickly bush, so I was wondering whether there was another one behind it, perhaps. Nevertheless, you can pray to the bush and it can give you a blessing. I didn't want to pray for it. I thought maybe touching it will help, but I haven't felt anything since then. Now, this is the type of paganism that is being taught there. Isn't it incredible? Uh, wherever the so-called counter-reformation started by the Jesuits gained hold of the people, the vernacular was suppressed and the Bible kept from the laity. So eager were the Jesuits to destroy the authority of the Bible the paper pope of the Protestants, that's what they called it, as they contemptuously called it, that they even did not refrain from criticizing its genuous and historical value. The Jesuits made war against the Protestant Bible. Before the English people could go the way of the continent and be brought to the question their great English Bible, the course of their thinking must first be changed. Much had to be done to discredit in their eyes the Reformation, its history, doctrines, documents, which they look, looked upon as the great work of God. So this is what they had to do. They had to destroy this thinking. Now, a very interesting statement, and we'll see who it comes from in a moment. Despite all the persecution they, the Jesuits, have met with, this is a Roman Catholic speaking, they have not abandoned England where they are a greater number of Jesuits than in Italy. Take note. Greater number of Jesuits than in Italy. There are Jesuits in all classes of society, in Parliament, among the English clergy, among the Protestant laity, even in the higher stations. I could not comprehend how a Jesuit could be a Protestant priest or how a Protestant priest could be a Jesuit. But my confessor silenced my scruples by telling me, Omnia munda mundes and that St. Paul became a Jew that he might save the Jews, it was no wonder, therefore, that if a Jesuit should feign himself a Protestant for the conversion of a Protestant, but pay attention, I entreat you, to discover concerning the nature of the religious movement in England turned Puseyism. The English clergy were formerly too much attached to their article of faith to be shaken from them. You might have employed in vain all the machines set in motion by Bossuet, and the Jansenists from France, that's the ones who were, you know, behind the French Revolution, the Jesuits and all of that, to reunite them with the Romish Church. So the Jesuits of England tried another plan. This was to demonstrate from history and ecclesiastical antiquity the legitimacy of the usage of the English Church whence through the exertion of the Jesuits concealed amongst its clergy might arise a studious attention to Christian antiquity. Who wrote this? Who wrote this, that the Jesuits were the priests in the Protestant churches? It was Descantus, priest at Rome, professor of theology, official theological censor of the Inquisition. The man himself tells us that it was so. 
Now, Romanism is known to have recently entered the Church of England. Before 1833, if you held a Mass like they hold it today, that was an anathema. If you did the things and said the things they said then, that was an anathema. Afterwards, things change. Newman, leader of the Oxford movement, that's their university, only through the English church can you act upon the English nation. I wish, of course, our church should be consolidated with and through and in your communion for its sake and your sake and for the sake of unity. He and his associates believed that Protestantism was the Antichrist. Okay. Father, one of the associates of Newman, he was also in the Oxford New movement, he said, Protestantism is perishing. What is good in it is by God's mercy being gathered into the garners of Rome. My whole life, God willing, shall be one crusade against the detestable and diabolical heresy of Protestantism. So here is a war in the English church. I believe, he said, Antichrist will be infidel and arise out of what calls itself Protestantism. So he's just turning it round. And the Church of Rome and England will be united in one to oppose it. Fascinating stuff. Revelation 13, 18, they changed. Uh, they didn't change the number 666, but in the revised version they have a footnote which says, and his number is 616. Just for interest's sake. Now let's get to t these two gentlemen, Westcott and Hort. These are the ones that wrote based on the ancient manuscript, the Greek text upon which all modern translations are based. Who were these two gentlemen and what did they believe? Now, everything I'm going to say about them comes from books written by the sons of Westcott and Hort, publishing their own letters. So this is not what somebody says about them. This is they themselves saying what they believe. This is the horse's mouth. Wonderful to have quotes like that. They probably wish they had never done that after this lecture. Hort, as well as Westcott, rejected the idea of infallibility of the Bible, called the doctrine of substitutionary atonement, that Jesus died for you, he called it immoral. He denied the historicity of Genesis, he praised Darwin, and he denied the divinity of Christ. Does it sound familiar? Who were these people, Professor Westcott and Hort? Westcott was born in 1825, Hort born in 1828. They were members of the Broad Church, the High Church Party of the Church of England. They became friends during their student days at Cambridge University, worked together. Westcott became Bishop of Durham, and Hort is best remembered as Professor of Divinity at Cambridge University. Well, their doctrines are so Jesuit that I wouldn't be surprised if they were two of these illustrious gentlemen. Hort's view on evolution, he says, the beginning of an individual is precisely as inconceivable as the beginning of a species. It certainly startles me to find you saying that you have seen no facts which support such a view as Darwin's. But he was a Darwinist. And uh, he says, his book drove me to the conclusion that some kind of development must be supposed. So he was a Darwinist. This is a letter from Hort to Macmillan, he writes another last word on Darwin, I shall not let the subject drop in a hurry, or to speak more correctly, it will not let me drop. And so he continues to say that he is a Darwinist. Here is another letter from Hort to Westcott, have you read Darwin? How I should like to talk with you about it. And another letter to Ellerton, but the book which has most engaged me is Darwin. Another letter of Hort to Ellerton, I had no idea till the last few weeks of the importance of the texts, and these are the new ones that had now been found, having read so little Greek Testament and dragged on with the villainous Textus Receptus. So he calls the received text villainous. Think of that vile Textus Receptus. Doesn't that sound like a Jesuit? Who hated the received text, who called it that asp, that serpent leaning entirely on late manuscripts. There comes their argument. The Sinai text was early. It is a blessing there are such early ones. Then, Hort, to Reverend Ellerton, one result of our talk I may as well tell you, he, Westcott, and I are going to edit the Greek text of the New Testament some two or three years hence, if possible. And he talks about Lachman and Tischendorf, who will supply the materials. And then uh, he says... 
Our object is to supply clergymen generally, schools, etc., with a portable Greek text which shall not be disfigured with Byzantine corruptions. In other words, it won't contain what the received text contains. How are they going to do this? Another letter, Westcott to Hort, as to our proposed recension of the New Testament text, our object should be, I suppose, to prepare a text for common and general use. With such an end in view, would it not be best to introduce only certain emendations? Only change it a little bit here and a little bit there? Into the received text and to take note in the margin, such as seem likely or noticeable of the Griechsbach's manner? You know, if we change it completely, these British will get nervous. Let's just change it here and there, and right in the margin, what we think is important. So that when they read it, and they read the manuscript margin, they'll say, oh, yes, we see that this probably shouldn't be that, because an early manuscript, corrupt one, they don't say that, it doesn't have it. You see what I mean? That's what they've decided. I feel most keenly disgraced of circulating what I feel to be falsified copies of Holy Scripture. That's a reference to the... Uh, authorized version, and I'm most anxious to provide something to replace them. This cannot be any text resting solely on our own judgment, even if we were not too inexperienced to make one. So he's quite willing to write another Bible all by himself. But it must be supported by a clear and obvious preponderance of evidence. The margin will give ample scope for our own ingenuity or principle. So I suggest when you read the margins, distrust them completely. My wish would be to leave the popular received text except where it is clearly wrong, in his opinion, of course. And then he says this interesting thing. Westcott, Gorham, Benson, Bradshaw, Lourdes and I have started the Society for the Investigation of Ghosts. Okay, they were spiritists. And all supernatural appearances and effects being all disposed to believe that such things really exist and ought to be discriminated from hoaxes and mere subjective delusions. And uh, they call it all kinds of names, cock and bull club, etc., etc. And out of this developed an incredible society. In 1882, the Society for Psychical Research was founded. In effect, it was a combination of those groups already working independently, so they work with telepathy, clairvoyance, etc. And uh, this is ancient occult wisdom. And Cambridge University Ghost Society was founded by no less a person than Edward White Benson, future Archbishop of Canterbury, together with these illustrious persons, and Darwin also attended. Now, this society... The Society for Psychical Research is also the society which runs the esoteric side of the New Age movement today, with its channeling and its communication with the spirit world. All of these things are in there. Among the numerous persons and groups who were in the middle of the 19th century were making inquiries, there you will see Edward White Benson, Archbishop of Canterbury, his son, A.C. Benson, uh, will be found under the year 1851 with the following paragraph. Among my father's diversions at Cambridge was the foundation of a ghost society. And then people like Lightfoot and Westcott and Hort were among the members. There it is. He was then always more interested in psychical phenomena than, and, than he cared to admit. Very well. So... The evolution from traditional mediumship to contemporary chan channeling has been gradual. The original spiritualism started in 1848, then came the Society of Psychical Research in Britain, and then Helena Petrovna Blavatsky took this up and continued, and she's the one that wrote, Lucifer is the Logos, the serpent, the savior. Satan is the only god of this planet. That's what she wrote. That's where it came from. The secret doctrine comes from this group. Now, did they belong to any other secret societies? The answer is yes. Hort was a member of a secret society. He found time to attend the meeting of various societies and June joined the mysterious company of the apostles. 
He remained always a grateful and loyal member of the Secret Club, which has now, 1896, become famous for the number of distinguished men who have belonged to it. In his time, the club was in a manner reinvigorated, and he, this is Hort, was mainly responsible for the wording of the oath which binds the members to a conspiracy of silence. Did he belong to a secret society, yes or no? Yes. Which binds them to silence. Does this sound Masonic to you, yes or no? Well, the Prime Minister of England was also in there, and he wrote the Constitution for the League of Nations, where he insisted that all religions should become one, and wrote an esoteric solution to that, which is also Masonic. So these people were Masons. Now, we saw yesterday that the high initiates believe that who is God? The devil is God. Satan is God. Lucifer is God. So, Mr. Hort, are you going to rewrite the Bible while you believe that Lucifer is the son of God? Doesn't that mean that Jesus must be made less than he is, yes or no? Wouldn't they want to rewrite the Bible so that Jesus is written out of the Constitution, yes or no? Well, do we find that today, or don't we? That's the question. I'm not going to answer it tonight. We'll answer it tomorrow. We'll see for ourselves. Bring your Bibles along. Let's have a look. 1854, Hort to Reverend John Ellerton. I agree with you in thinking it is a pity that Maurice verbally repudiates purgatory, but I fully and unwaveringly agree with him in the three cardinal points of the controversy that certain uh, that eternity is independent of duration, that the power of repentance is not limited to this life. Can you believe this? He believes in purgatory and that you can repent on the other side, that it is not revealed whether or not all will, be al will ultimately repent. The modern denial of the second has, I suppose, had more to do with the de-spiritualizing of theology than almost anything that could be named. Okay, he believed the Roman Catholic doctrine of purgatory. Does he say anything further on it? Here he is advising a young student. He wrote, the idea of purgation, purgatory, burning your sins off on the other side, of cleansing as by fire, seems to me inseparable from what the Bible teaches us. So is he teaching Jesuit doctrine or is he teaching Protestant doctrine? You tell me. He's teaching Jesuit doctrine. But it's very clever to say he's a Protestant so that Protestants will accept his Bible because this Bible now comes from a Protestant's pen, if you don't know. So, teaches us that divine chastisement and little and though little is directly said respecting the future state, it seems to me incredible that the divine chastisement should in this respect change their character when this visible life is ended. So he believes in purgatory. What does he say about the atonement, that Jesus died for you? Well, here is his letter in Life, Volume 1, page 322. I think I mentioned to you before Campbell's book on the atonement, which is invaluable as far as it goes, but unluckily he knows nothing except Protestant theology. Okay, what does he say? Letter, Hort to Westcott. I entirely agree. Correcting one word with what you there say on the atonement, having for many years believed that the absolute union of the Christian or rather of man with Christ himself is the spiritual truth of which the popular doctrine of substitution is an immoral and material counterfeit. Wow! So Jesus died for you is an immoral doctrine. Rather what is moral that we become one with him in Christ and become God. That's moral. Now who teaches that? The Jesuits and the Freemasons? Or the Bible? Who teaches that? Well, what was this man? Belonged to a secret society, had a psychic club, and not only that, he hates the received text and he spits on the atonement. That's like a Templar. That's spitting on the cross. Certainly nothing can be more unscriptural than the modern limiting of Christ's bearing our sins and sufferings to his death but indeed, that is only one aspect of an almost universal heresy. Okay, these are the people 
who have trans who've created the document on which the modern Bibles are based. Do you believe they're trustworthy? I don't think so. Here's another letter, Hort to Reverend Davies. No rational being doubts the need for a revised Bible, and the popular practical objections are worthless. Yet I have an increasing feeling in favor of delay. He was having problems because the British still knew their Bibles. Of course, no revision can be final and it would be absurd to wait for perfection, but the criticism of both testament in text and interpretation alike appears to me to be just now in this chaotic state. <clears throat> in Germany, hardly as if all the less in England, that the results of immediate revision would be peculiarly unsatisfactory. Oh, the British knew their Bibles. This was a problem. We have to be careful and sneaky with what we are going to do. Then he says, <clears throat> well, let's first read what it says down here. It is, of course, true that we can only know God through human forms, but then I think the whole Bible echoes the language of Genesis 1.27 and so assures us that human forms are divine forms. Gotcha, Mr. Hort. What is he saying? He's saying we are God. We are God. Who teaches that? Satan teaches that. Now listen to this. 1 John 5 verse 7 <clears throat> in the King James. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. What does that make Jesus? <coughs> Makes him God. You will search in vain in the modern Bibles for that verse. You won't find it in the NIV. You won't find it in the RSV. It's been removed so that they can be God. Hort to Westcott. I have been persuaded for many years that Mary worship and Jesus worship have very much in common in their causes and their results. Perhaps the whole question may be said to be involved in the true idea of mediation, which is almost universally corrupted in one or both of the opposite directions. Huh. So who can mediate for you just as well? Mary can. Is that Catholic doctrine or biblical doctrine? What about the other man? Westcott writes, I've been trying to recall my impressions of La Salette. That's interesting. La Salette, we'll be talking about La Salette, a Marian shrine. I wish I could see what forgotten truth Mariolatry bears witness and how we can practically set forth the teachings of the miracles. Well, Mr. Westcott, so you want to bring Mariolatry in and make Jesus less? Westcott to Reverend Benson, as far as I could judge, the idea of La Salette was that of God revealing himself now and not in one form, but in many. Hort to Reverend Roland, there are, I fear, still more serious differences between us on the subject of authority, and especially the authority of the Bible. If this primary objection were removed and I could feel our differences to be only a degree, I would still blah, blah, blah. So, he wants to go away from this idea that the Bible is inspired and uh, the errors, errors and prejudices which we agree in wishing to remove can surely be more wholesomely and also more effectively reached by individual efforts of an indirect kind than by combined open assault. Though I think that convocation is not competent to initiate such a measure, yet I feel that as we three are together, it would be wrong not to make the best of it, as Lightfoot says. Indeed, there is a very fair prospect of good work if we three stick together, though neither with this body nor any other body likely to be formed now could a complete textual revision be possible. We can't change everything now. Let's do it bit by bit. We stick together, we three. There is some hope that alternative readings might find a place in the margin. So as we go from translation to translation, you find some in the margin, and in the next version, oops, they're gone, axed, away. And so the Bible changes. You know, if you pick up your Bibles, and you turn to the middle of the book of Acts, 
If you take an NIV Bible and you go to the middle of the book of Acts and then you page and look how many words there are to the end of Revelation, that's how many words are gone out of the modern Bibles. From the middle of Acts to the end of Revelation. Now if man is not to live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord, how are you going to do that with so many words gone? Up to 60,000 of them gone. Ought we not to have a conference before the first meeting for revision? There are many points on which it is important that we should agree. The rules, though liberal, are vague, and the interpretation of them will depend upon decided action at first. It is quite impossible to judge the value of what will appear to be trifling alterations. A one word changed in a text so that people don't even notice it trifling alterations merely by reading them one after another. Taken together, they have often important bearings which few would think of at first. Are you with me on this one? We'll change the Bible a tad there and a tad there, and if we take it all together, well, we'll have an entirely different doctrines, and those stupid goyim won't even have noticed. That's what he's saying. Well, we're going to do that tomorrow. I'm going to show you trifling little changes, and you will be shocked as to what they did to Jesus Christ, our Lord. You will hopefully be shocked. Remember, trifling little changes. The difference between a picture say, of Raphael and a feeble copy of it, is made up of a number of trivial differences. Isn't that interesting? We have successfully resisted being warned of dangerous ground where the needs of revision required that it should be shirked. It is one can hardly doubt the beginning of a new period in church history. So far, the angry objections have reason for their astonishment. These people are subtle. Balfour was a member of Hort's Apostles and uh, president of the, the Society for Psychic Research. As I said, he was Prime Minister of England and he wrote the first draft for the League of Nations or he was responsible, partly responsible at least in that. So these were high-flying individuals. Let's look at this interesting extract from a book, Which Bible? by David Fuller. Hort writes to Reverend Roland Williams, October 21, 1858. Further, I agree with them, that's authors of Essays in Review, in condemning many leading specific doctrines of the popular theology. Evangelicals seem to me perverted rather than untrue. There are, I fear, still more serious differences between us and the subject of authority, especially the authority of the Bible. He doesn't believe in the authority of the Bible. He writes from France, after leaving the monastery, we shaped our course to the little oratory which we discovered on the summit of a neighboring hill. Fortunately, we found the door open, and there was this Pieta, the size of life, a virgin and the dead Christ. Had I been alone, I would have knelt there for hours. This is a Roman Catholic speaking. This is not a Protestant. If he wasn't a Jesuit, I'll eat my hat. Westcott writes to the Archbishop of Canterbury, an Old Testament criticism. No one now, I suppose, holds that the first three chapters of Genesis give a literal history. I could never understand how anyone reading them with open eyes could think they did. They didn't believe anything. And these are the best manuscripts in the world. Do you believe it? I'm inclined to think that no such state as Eden ever existed. And that Adam's fall in no degree differed from the fall of each of his descendants. There was no fall. This is occult teaching. Hort writes, the pure Romish view seems to be nearer and more likely to lead to the truth than the evangelical. So Rome is right, and the other one is wrong. Hort writes to Westcott, I remember shocking you and Lightfoot not so long ago by exposing a belief that Protestantism is only parenthetical and temporary. We'll get rid of it yet. It's in the way, it's a, na it's a nauseating interference at the moment. So we've seen now, firstly, when we look at the history of where these manuscripts come from, that the manuscripts 
have three streams. Two of them are akin. There are only two streams based on very few manuscripts leading to these changes. Corrupted probably by Oregon and continued by Eusebius. Then these people pick up these texts and say these are the oldest manuscripts, therefore they are the best and we will base the new translations on these manuscripts and throw aside the received text. Deuteronomy 11.16 says, Take heed to yourself that your heart be not deceived, and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. 1 Timothy 4.16 says, Take heed unto thyself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. What if the texts are so changed that you cannot support your doctrines anymore. What would you do then? Did you know that the doctrine of the dead, state of the dead, cannot be adequately supported from new manuscripts? Do you know that the divinity of Christ is a problem because a comma here and a little change there and something there changes the whole picture? Do you know that Jesus turns out to be the liar and the other one turns out to be more truthful if you read it? in the new manuscripts. It's quite interesting. I invite you to come tomorrow and listen. 2 Corinthians 2.17 says, For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, and in the sight of God speak we in Christ. If Jesus isn't everything and everything in our lives, then we have nothing. If Jesus isn't God, we have nothing to look forward to. The best we could hope for is a constant cycle of reincarnation into a miserable world. Now as a human, now as an animal, perhaps as a leaf to be eaten by a cow. Quite a miserable existence as far as I'm concerned. But if Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and he has paid the price for my sins, I have a way out. I have a solution to the problem I'm facing in the first place, and I have an answer to all my inner questions. Because I know where I come from. I come from a noble origin. I know why I am in the state that I am. I have fallen because of sin. And I have need of redemption, which I can find only in Him who made me in the first place. And this is the doctrine that is under attack. Darwinism is supposed to rule, in the place of creation, as we have seen, this is what these people believe, the atonement is to be written away so that Jesus doesn't fulfill that role anymore, and the Zoroaster and Osiris must become his equal. In fact, I must become his equal, because I am just as good as he is. I am also divine, so they claim. Either the one is true or the other. And then we have to answer ask another question. Why is Rome these days silent about the Bible, but still rants and raves about the received text? Why is it attacked everywhere in every single college of theology? Why do they say in the colleges of theology the very worst text in the world is the received text? Throw it aside. Here is something better for you. Come and see tomorrow how much better it is and see for yourselves. Thank you.